Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, May 26, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mr. Schlichtman? In the affirmative. Mr. Thielman? Here. Dr. Allison Ampey? Here. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Mr. Hayner? Here. Uh, and the administration, Dr. Holman? Here. Dr. McNeil? Here. Mr. Mason will not be joining us this evening. Ms. Elmer? Sorry, here. Threw me off. Mr. Mr. Spiegel? Yes. Bye. Hi. Our AEA rep, Ms. Fernandez? Here. Um, and our student reps, Amy Shellaru? Sorry if I'm not saying that. Here. Yes. And Megan Carmody? Here. Great. Thank you. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a remote model. On February 15th, 2022, Governor Baker signed into law a new session law extending certain COVID-19 related measures. The new law, Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, includes an extension until July 15th, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of the governor's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referred which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. And finally, each rule each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. Um, before we begin tonight, I um, just wanted to take a moment. Um, for those of you watching or listening at home, I will be mentioning the events that took place on Tuesday if you have small ears listening in and want to tune out. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the horrific and senseless act of violence that occurred on Tuesday at the Robb Elementary School in Olvade, Texas. An act of violence that took the lives of at least 19 children and two teachers. Today, May 26th, was supposed to be the last day of school for those students and teachers, a day students and teachers look forward to every year. I really don't have any words. I am a teacher, a parent, and a school committee member. I feel this with every piece of my being. I feel anger and sadness and frustration and heartbreak for the students, their families, their classmates, the teachers, their colleagues, and for educational institutions across this nation. A school system's mission is to educate our students for the ever-changing world ahead of us. Instead, teachers have been asked to protect students from violence, teach through a pandemic, and fight against social and systemic inequities. My heart goes out to the students, families, and community of Lavalde, Texas. I also want to express my deep appreciation for the families, teachers, administrators, and community here in Arlington for the support they've offered one another in the last two days. This affects all of us. We can and must do better for our children. Please take a moment of silent reflection for the 19 children and two teachers who were killed on Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. All right. Um, we are going to move to our first agenda item, which is <clears throat> um, a possible vote to approve a memorandum of agreement with the AEA Unit A from August 
sorry, 25th, 2022 to August 24th, 2024. Um, Ms. Fernandez, do you want us to go first or? I, I can share my news. So the okay. ADA did vote to ratify the contract uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to say thank you to Ms. Keys and Ms. Fernandez and the entire AEA Unit A negotiating team for working with us to come to this agreement. I also want to thank Mr. Cardin and Mr. Hayner, trying to find your pictures here, um, for your work on the school committee's behalf. We know that many school committees and educators unions are in negotiations right now, and we appreciate the efficient and collegial way that we were able to work together on this contract. Um, does someone want to make a motion? Move to approve the MOA between the Arlington School Committee, school, system, school Committee and the Arlington Educators Association and authorize uh, the chair to sign this if it passes. Second. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Hayner and a second by Mr. Schlickman. Any discussion? Mr. Cardin? Yes, I just want to <clears throat> echo the thanks of every, everybody involved, including the administrat administrative team, Mr. Spiegel, Dr. Homan, Dr. McNeil, um, our outside counsel, Liz Valerio, um, the excellent MTA um, facilitator, Sarah, I'm going to forget her last name, and um, <clears throat> and the AEA negotiating team, which is which was very large, and, and I don't have the full list in front of me, but thank you all for your cooperation, and I'm glad we were able to find common ground. Anybody else? All right, a roll call vote, Mr. Hayner? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes, it's unanimous. And thank you again, AEA, appreciate all of that. Um, public comment is next on our agenda, but we do not have anyone signed up for public comment. <clears throat> so we will move on. Um, AHS student representatives, um, Megan and Amy, if you wanna share something and then I have something to say. But I sure, well, there's not much to share right now. The um, student government elections are underway and the results will be announced tomorrow. So it's really all we're doing is just waiting for that. But we also just wanted to say um, thank you to all of you guys for allowing us to sit in on your meeting on the meetings this year. Um, it's been really great. And I think that the council's really appreciated being able to have this. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, was that my paper echo? Um, I just wanted to also say thank you both for your time and for sharing um, about things that are going on at the high school and <clears throat> in the Arlington Public Schools in general. We appreciate having a student perspective um, at our meetings. It's really important to, to have that, that perspective. Um, we have two more school committee meetings before the end of this school year, but you, um, I would like to relieve you of your duties so that you can enjoy your last few weeks uh, of the school year and have a wonderful summer. But if anything comes up, feel free to reach out to us. So thank you. I don't know if anybody else wants to say. Great. Hi. Dr. Hellman. I would, I'm try, sorry to put you both on the spot, but I'm curious um, what insights or things you might've learned from your experience being student reps on the school committee. Um, our advisor, Mr. McKnight, he really tries to make like the meetings seem as formal as possible and everything. We have like a, a gavel, we have approval of minutes and we all do like, like roll call and stuff. And I guess seeing like it actually done in a way that's like, really professional not just trying to imitate professional that's been kind of cool to see because that's what he wants and it's like we're kind of just goofing off you guys are like doing it in real life i guess that's awesome thank you so much for your service and for being here megan did you want to add anything i mean yeah also just seeing like how much all you guys do like i feel like before i 
was a rep I'm um, I was a representative I was also one last year but before that I didn't really know or I really know about the school committee at all but being able to actually like see everything you guys do is really cool and like thank you for everything you guys do great thank you okay um this sorry yep. I, I just want to say it it's our pleasure having you as well mm -hmm. uh you being there keep us on our toes as well. So thank you. Oh. Um, all right, our next item on the Madam agenda. Chair, Madam Chair. Sorry. Yes, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, I just want to thank them as well and note that uh, State Representative Garbley started off as a student rep and got elected to the school committee uh, when he was 18 or 19 and ended up uh, as a state rep, I think before he was 21. So uh, I hope that this is not your first foray into public governance. Uh, you found this rewarding and you keep on keeping on. Thank you. Okay. Um, update on district goal setting process, first read of district goals, Dr. Holman. Okay, I am going to share my screen. You should have in your materials a draft of a set of district goals that I'm happy to take any discussion and feedback on. It's this document here. Um, you will notice a little bit of a language shift from what the committee is used to, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, as well as a language shift even from what we discussed in CIAA. Um, in CIAA, we talked about having strategic initiatives underneath the goals, the overarching goals. Um, since then, feedback from my administrative team, who thinks a lot about initiatives, um, suggested that we call these objectives as opposed to initiatives. And I thought that that was that their feedback was well um, noted. So I did change the language here. But again, these are drafts, so we can certainly change anything back. Uh, but before we talk about those, I want to give a little bit of an overview on where we are with regards to strategic planning. We're in a bit of an awkward dance right now, which we discussed in CIAA, where we have an existing um, set of practices around goal setting and timelines around that. And we're working on building a district mission, vision, and strategic priorities. Um, and it's the end of the year. We need to prepare our teachers for what it is we're going to be working on next year. We need to prepare over the summer. And so we need kind of have two simultaneous threads going at the same time. And I want to talk through how I see those working together um, as we prepare to have a new strategic plan that should be slated for to begin implementation in um, spring of 2023. So actually January of 2023. So I want to talk first about how we developed the strategic objectives that you have um, in your packet to review and discuss tonight. Um, I'd like to do a bit of a preview and a timeline uh, on the work of the strategic planning team that's been convening this spring, preview the organization of a five-year strategic plan, and then have some discussion about how the committee would like to see us share the work of the strategic planning committee with the community. Uh, as well as have any discussion that you have around the strategic objectives that are in the document in your materials. So to develop the strategic goals and objectives that are in your materials for tonight, um, we started with an articulation of what we're currently working on. So we really wanted these to reflect stuff that we have been deeply thinking about this year. We wanted these goals to be broad and overarching so that they could be interdisciplinary and cross school. So we're happy to answer questions about what action steps we imagine might fit underneath any one of those strategic um, goals that you have in that document. We were really trying to make sure that we got review and feedback from the curriculum team and tweaked according to their feedback. That's where the switch from initiative to strategic goal came from. Um, from our central office cabinet team, uh, from our principals, we're still in the process of getting input from them. Most of what we want them to do is actually take these and map them onto their school improvement planning for the fall. And that's how they will sort of um, manifest whatever the goals are going to be. And then review and feedback from the CIAA subcommittee that happened last Friday and is ongoing. We'll continue to um, circle up with that subcommittee, both to report out on the goals and to tweak them as needed. 
Um, we also had a lengthy conversation at CIA subcommittee about um, the vision statement and did some tweaking of it after that. And also we did um, some, we need to do some approval of these things in June. So that's forthcoming. So I'd like to share with you the work of the strategic planning team so far. They do have a draft vision statement, which you can see on your screen for the district. And just as a bit of a reminder, this group actually did a lot of conversation for about an hour and a half on one of our meeting days to talk about the difference between a vision statement and a mission statement. What does a vision statement do? What does a mission statement do? So uh, for the community and the committee, a little bit of definitional work here. The vision statement should really reflect the aspirational future state that we're striving for. You never, you may never reach the reality of a vision statement, but it is something that you can constantly work towards, that you can constantly improve towards. Um, it's sort of your dream state or the horizon you're headed towards. The mission statement, in contrast, is actually a bit more of a roadmap. How are we going to get there? What are the actions that we're going to take? What is our purpose as an organization towards contributing to that vision that we have um, as a community? for what education should be and should do for our students. So the draft vision statement that has gone through several rounds, several iterations, several um, sets of people coming to an agreement and then mixing with another group and needing to merge their ideas is as follows. The, the vision of APS, if it were to be approved by the committee at some point as we get all of these other parts together would be to create a connected and inclusive educational community where all learners feel a sense of belonging, experience joy and growth and are empowered to determine their own futures. So we can talk about that more and how we got to some of those words if you'd like when I'm done. As we work towards a five-year plan, some of the language might need to shift in order to accommodate the structure of that plan. So the current language that the committee uses is they have four overarching goals and then beneath those goals each year at this time about the administration pr um, proposes goal objectives. A proposed shift in language would be to have four to five strategic priorities. This is something that the committee is going to be working on at their next meeting next Tuesday. Um, beneath those strategic priorities, there would be strategic objectives as opposed to goal objectives. Um, a goal and an objective are, mean generally the same thing. Um, we want to really highlight the fact that we're trying to be strategic. We're trying to build a five-year plan, and we're trying to make sure that uh, whatever we are doing, it is towards the aim of meeting our vision through the actions that are articulated in our eventual draft mission statement. So the organization of this plan would look something like this. Um, we can certainly tweak what the organization would look like, but it would have those district vision and mission statements towards the top, perhaps with some, some framing language. Now we do have the vision of student as learner uh, as part of the documentation that already exists for the district. And a lot of the same ideas and words that are in that vision statement are mirrored in the more concise vision statements and mission statements that we're working on developing as a strategic planning team. So I'm imagining taking some of the language we already have about what Arlington Public Schools strives for and wrapping it into some um, context language that would help explain what we mean when we talk about uh, educational system that has the vision and mission that we ultimately land on. And then beneath this sort of overarching framing language, there would be five, four or five major priority areas um, my, I'm imagining that these are going to be somewhat similar in terms of scope to the priority areas we already have. So there's one that's focused on student achievement. There's one that's focused on professional development and human resources. There's, and there are two that are focused on um, operations and infrastructure, one of which is really focused on community engagement. It seems unlikely that that would, the focus of the priority areas would stray much from where they are now. They may be more concise statements about what it is specifically that we're striving for. And then underneath each one of those, there would be strategic objectives, like what you have tonight to take a look at. And for each of those overall, and for each fiscal year, there would be action steps, there would be outputs, there would be outcomes. So outputs would be the stuff that we would produce as a result of having done that work. So we would expect to see these specific things in place, maybe protocols or procedures or an actual tangible outcome. Um, there would be outcomes and benchmarks. So what data do we expect to see shift? And how will we know if it is? What are our benchmarks against which we are comparing? And then there would be budget implications. And this piece that's in gray would be on some sort of a cycle. 
that would need to be revisited on a regular basis. This is how you keep a strategic plan alive is you have to constantly be coming back to it, seeing how you did against those benchmarks, analyzing whether or not any of your, just, your goals or plans need to change. So to talk a little bit about that cycle, this is the piece that would sort of wrap your existing cycle into the cycle of the strategic plan. Um, and here's how I'm imagining it, but of course we can shift this cycle, however the committee sees, um, sees fit. So essentially what we would do is in the fall, we would do outcomes and school improvement plan reporting. This is our opportunity to report out on the outcomes and the impact of the work that had been done the previous year, because at that point we have data on that from the previous year. We use those outcomes and whatever our plan articulates is the plan for the following year to do our budget development and have conversations about what it is the district needs to structurally adjust or plan for or provide resources for in order to continue implementing the plan. And then when we get into the spring, right about now, we would report out on progress and any adjustments that might be, need to be made to strategic objectives and action steps for the following year. And then over the summer, we would work to make sure that those strategic objectives landed in the planning that the principals do for their school improvement plans. And we would report out on the impact of the previous year once we have the data back from the previous year. So that cycle would iterate itself multiple times. And these things would be subject to some degree of change. You won't, don't wanna to stray too far from what you've articulated as your plan, but you wouldn't necessarily have a brand new set of strategic objectives each year. You might be tweaking them here and there as you go. You might be tweaking action steps as you learn more or as new priorities arise. And that appears, nope, that appears to be my last slide. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I will say that um, there have been some conversations in the strategic planning team about making sure that the community is aware of all of the work that's happening in that strategic planning team and giving the community an opportunity to take a look at that vision statement and articulate what it means to them. What does it look like if we have a, an organization that gives all students a sense of belonging and empowers them to determine what their future is going to look like? What would that mean for your child? Um, what, what do you need us to take into consideration as we plan for actually building out the strategic plan itself? What are some of the things that need to happen in year one versus in year three or four or five? So I'm open to the committee's thoughts on this, but I was considering hosting some forums over the summer and into the fall that would allow community members to engage with the vision statement, the mission, the mission statement, and the four and the four or five priority areas uh, as we are actually drafting and writing a five-year strategic plan, because I think that that will help the community understand what the strategic plan is, what it looks like, what it's for, uh, what the process is for evaluating our progress towards it and also help us better understand what people actually think we mean when we talk about a school system that meets the vision statement that I just showed you. So I'll stop talking at this point, answer any questions that the committee has about that process, um, that structure, or the strategic objectives that were in your materials for tonight. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. Um, so going back to the action items, do you view those typically as being multi-year items or just an annual thing? So I think the action steps are more annual. Those are gonna be more granular. So it's gonna be, here's what we intend to do this year. And those action steps would change year to year underneath that strategic objective. A lot of the strategic objectives we have in the document that you have for tonight are actually multi-year things that we're no, we know aren't gonna take us only just the 22-23 school year. So the hope is that many of those can be put into the strategic plan pretty directly without us needing to resort or rewrite things much. And then we can write out action steps that are going to take it like out over multiple years. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I think it's, this sounds like a good way to frame this whole process. And I, I'm just, I just have a, a couple of questions. One is, I'm just curious to know um, what the how what the committee's reaction was to the um, to the uh, overarching goal that we drafted about a decade ago. I'm just curious to know what was their reaction to that. Uh, we have, we're actually going to take a pretty close look at those at our next meeting. They, they spent more time looking at our mission and vision, existing mission and vision statements. Um, one of the reactions of, I recall the reaction of a student was, holy cow, there's a lot of jargon in here. What does that word mean? Um, and then another one, another community member read the sentence out loud 
and said that it was just a really long sentence. So it was hard to follow the, the sort of thought or thread through it. Um, and I do know that we had looked at strategic priorities a little bit towards the beginning or the overarching goals. Um, and one challenge that was raised is some lack of differentiation between the last two, which talk about infrastructure and resources, both of them do, and operations. And so which operations go under which one has been a little bit of discussion too. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we were trying to get to something that everyone could agree on. That's why the sentence got long. That's really how it worked. Um, so, and I'm and I'm curious. You know, one of the, the the one of the objective, the first objective that we spent a lot of time on a while ago. It was a different era, I understand. Was um, this idea that you know the Arlington Public Schools were preparing people for the next level of their education, whatever it might be, whatever course it might take. Um, so, you know, high school, elementary school was designed to prepare for middle school, middle school for high school, and then and then high school for post-secondary studies of some sort, whatever it might be, that they were prepared to enter into a post-secondary degree program of some sort, that they were at least prepared for that, and then they would have the choice of whether or not to pursue it. So I'm just wondering if that, maybe not articulated in the same way, but if that objective was still something that was felt a felt priority. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. We, there's been a lot of talk about that. I think that piece that you see in the vision statement around that empowerment to determine their own future is, is a nod to what will become a priority around student achievement and making sure that all students are challenged, ensuring that all students have a, a route forward to opportunity, um, opportunity in post-secondary education really being sort of the standard. So. Okay, good. Because yeah. I mean, I th the thinking at the time <clears throat> a while back was that we wanted to in we wanted to ensure the curriculum was rigorous enough so that students left the system prepared to make whatever educational choice they wanted to make mm -hmm. in terms of their future studies. So that that's I just I just curious to see how if that's um, still on the table. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then um, the timeline for this. So we would would uh, and the process. Are are we are we gonna like enshrine this in policy is that what we want to do or are we just going to get rid of the old policy and because i'm not sure it's necessary for it to be in policy but we felt it was necessary a decade ago and i don't know what people's thinking is right now i can weigh in but then i think it's up to the, the ultimately that that question is up to the committee yeah i you guess it's, have yeah. the overarching goals in enshrined in policy um yeah. and in some of the vision and mission work. And th at the end of the day, the strategic plan is the districts and the implementation of it, especially through financial support is the committees. Um, right. So so I would my answer initially would be yes, in that elements okay. that are getting revised now are already in policy. All right, maybe we'd want to enshrine. Okay, so it'd be a policy vote and all that. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. I think, I think it's a great framing. I think it's a good start. I think it's exciting and I think the community's excited too. And I think it's time to refresh, you know, the overarching goals and all that stuff. It's, you know, it's been a decade. This is a good time to do it. Anybody else? Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I, I'm really happy with the vision statement as it's coming out. I think the, the real difference that we've got in the vision statement now than the stuff that we were having before is the presence of students in here uh, because their voice is being heard as to not just what we want to do to them, but how they really view themselves within the process and they want to be heard and empowered. So I think we're, we're, we're moving forward and we're doing some really good, great work. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Kirsten's yeah. waving. So I, I'll, I, I'll echo my appreciation for all the work that um, that has been done on this. I, I just have two sort of process questions. So my understanding is that we are going to approve um, these strategic goals at the next school committee meeting, and that this will allow educators to do what they need to do. Um, oh, sorry, Dr. Elson, I made it into your um, 
what they'll need to do for their professional development planning. And now I've lost Dr. Holman on the. I'm, I'm here. Um, <laughs> so yes, so this is the first read of the strategic objectives. The strategic objectives aren't part of the work that the strategic planning committee is doing. They're not articulating those. They're articulating the big priorities, the vision and the mission. Um, we should have a draft vision, mission and strategic priorities for the next meeting. And that can be a first read for the committee on those. Uh, we would like to lock those in before the summer because some of the writing and some of the like sharing out with the community, as I indicated, could happen over the summer. Um, but the strategic objectives today is a first read of those. We can approve those at the next meeting. We could uh, do it at the following meeting after that. Um, sort of that timeline is a little bit separate from the work of the strategic planning committee for now. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, so I had a few questions or comments, um, mostly sort of process things. Uh, first, when will the school committee review and approve the vision and mission statement? Or Dr. Homa, were you saying that it belongs to the school system, so we don't? Or you know, I'm, I'm confused about that. I'm saying that be, because it, the overarching goals, the vision and the mission are in school committee policy now, and because those are the sort of central framing components of a strategic plan, that yes, I would seek the school committee's approval of those items. And that, okay. that a first read of that should be available to you at the next meeting. And then a second read could happen at the next June meeting. Um, for approval at that point, or if we needed to have another meeting at some point in the summer to further discuss it, we could do that too. Okay, so I was just making sure that it was being approved by us, assuming that's what we wanted to do before you went out and started having yes. the community dialogue on it. Um, okay, so then thinking about the new process. So first, I'm not sure I totally have in my head what the new process is, not, not because you didn't explain it, but I'm just trying to picture what it looks like on the ground. And I don't have that in my head, but the two comments I have is, one, I'm a little concerned. It seems like potentially you're going to be making a whole lot of goals or objectives or whatever you're calling them. Um, and whether there's going to be more than is, that I'm concerned that there'll be an unwieldy number. Um, second, it's a little unclear to me how, when they get refreshed, I mean, the, not the action steps, I understand that part, but when do we go back to the strategic objectives and refresh those? And it felt like they were potential, I mean, I understand that some things are, or more um, you know, multi-year and sometimes we finish things, which is great. And so clearly those would drop off, but whether they, you know, when do we look at them and decide, yes, we're still, we still want to, you know, this is still a major thing we want to be thinking about or uh, also we've got something else that is a bigger deal that we need to put in so we're going to have to knock something off so we don't end up with too much so yep. so that's where your existing practice and this process overlap nicely because i'm imagining that strategic objective piece would happen each spring and we would take a look at the strategic objectives for the following year and the and there will be action steps in the strategic plan associated with those and if we need to make revisions at that point in the spring we would do that similar to how you approve um, the goals for the school system. Now we would do the same thing each year in the spring so that everybody knows what they're planning on doing for the fall. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thielman. I know this is the second time. Thank you for recognizing me. Um, so I think we have, we have policy AD and I think if we're gonna have two readings, then we would be, it would be formally be, a, you know, a, first reading is next the next meeting and that would be understood to be replacing policy ad and then the second meeting we vote to 
replace policy AD with the new goals. And that seems perfectly fine to me. And also I would say, I, I don't, well, I may not, I don't see everything written out yet. So I may have questions, but I think it's better that, the, that this committee is, is wordsmithing all this stuff than us. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thanks, sorry. Um, I think we're just, next week, we're just gonna have the uh, mission and vision, right? We won't have the goals at that. I mean, so we got two different sets of goals coming along. Yeah. And we've got the new ones that we're approving, you know, the, the um, what do you call it? The old goals with the new strategic objectives attached to them that's gonna be in play for next year. And then we're gonna have new, I don't remember the wording, I'm just gonna call them new goals. New goals with strategic objectives, which may be the same or different than what we've just passed. And those aren't gonna be ready next week, are they? I may have a draft ready next week. That is the agenda item on the next meeting of the committee, which is on Tuesday of next week. So depending upon how, well, that's their last meeting. So from that, we should be able to gather enough to draft something that the committee can look at at the next meeting. Um, I just wanna be clear that, like I said, I think that the focus of those strategic priorities is not going to be qualitatively different from the focus of the four overarching goals. I think it is possible that there may be a fifth overarching goal that says something about equity and access. Um, I think it's possible that the language of those overarching goals is condensed so that it's more specific about what the next five years priority is going to be. But I think that the overarching goal, the strategic objectives that you have tonight that are more specific for next year should slot nicely underneath what the strategic priorities are going to be because the conversations we've been having, like I said to Mr. Thielman, really revolve around the very things that the current overarching goals already focus on. So there's gonna be one on student achievement, there's gonna be one on professional development and human resources, there's gonna be one on operations and one on community engagement. It's just a matter of crafting with the, commu the community and the committee what the specific things about community engagement are that need to improve in the next five years to help craft that language and make it really specific. That makes sense? Yeah, I was just suggesting this, Mr. Thielman is saying we can just take, take out the old, toss it, put in the new, and I'm just concerned whether the new is gonna be actually ready to be plunked in and I wasn't clear to me that it will be so I'm again I'm I'm just more talking process that I, I'm not sure we can do what Mr. Thielman suggested because we have to wait until I mean this the mission and vision will be ready but the goals I'm just not sure are going to be quite baked but they may not I guess be. we'll see we may need more time yeah. So it sounds like we can see what comes to us on June 9th and how the committee feels about um, about bringing it back on the 23rd for a vote if we need to refer it to CIA again for some more um, <clears throat> some more consideration. So I think at this point we can see what comes to us on June 9th and then work from there. Um, whether we feel like June 23rd is soon enough or if we need to, to wait longer. Just, I just want, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't, if, if we can do that, meet the 9th, to do a first read, meet the, between the 9th and the 23rd and the CIA committee just to make sure we're aligned and then approve on the 23rd, I think it would help the district do planning and work over the summer to get ready for the new year. That's all. That, I think that would be most helpful to the team. If we're not ready, we're not ready. If it's not, if it's not, if it's, you know, we're not aligned and we're not ready, we're not ready. Anybody else? Okay. Um, all right. Paul was trying to talk. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Schleckman. 
Yeah, I, you know, Jeff, Jeff has a really good point, uh, but there are a couple of ways we can work on it uh, in that if we have a conversation on the, on the first meeting in June and do a first read uh, at, the, at the second meeting, uh, we're well on our way to being where we need to be, or we could suspend the rules to approve it in the second meeting in June. Lots of ways we can play this, but I don't think that we're going to be in a position where there's going to be much conflict with uh, uh, what's before us and in, in, in what we're looking to do. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, summer programming report. Dr. McNeil. Yes, thank you. And I do apologize for my lighting. I, I got to work on my lighting. Um, so I'm able to share my screen. Yes, I am. Okay, so um, yes. So here's a summer programming report. Uh, I sent this ahead of time. So you have all the details. I won't go all, all into get very granular, but I will give some highlights for each one of the programs. Um, again, I'm very excited that we're able to, so uh, for our Title I, we're able to extend it to non-Title I students. So if you see there, you'll see the selection process that we put in place in order to identify students who would um, benefit from being part of the summer program. You see, we're focusing on reading K through three and math K through five. Um, and then you see the time that they'll be meeting every day. Uh, we do have uh, in-person and remote. Uh, we found that um, have offering that option of remote to families is beneficial because it gives access. And that is something that we learned through the pandemic. So we wanna continue uh, with that. Um, and the reason that we are able to offer that extended summer learning program is because we're using ESSER funds in order to um, add students who are not in the Title I program throughout the year. So what we did is we started with the Title I schools. We developed a, a list of students that would need, that could benefit from being in part of the program, and then we extended it to non-Title I schools. So that was part of the selection process. Um, and then see here for literacy, you'll see the number of students for in-person, number of students for remote, the team, and then the focus of instruction. Here in math, again, you see the number of students that are gonna be in person, number of students remote. And then if you click on the summer benchmarks that goes over the, um, the things that they'll focus on through the summer programming. We are also offering a, a program for our EL students. You'll see there, there's a description of the program. Uh, and this is for our elementary. So it's for ELL newcomers entering grades one through five. It is going to be in person at Bishop School. Uh, we see that right now we have 40, 45 to 50 newcomers. Um, and then you'll see the dates there. And then we're also offering for the secondary level uh, at Odyssey Middle School. There's two classrooms. And then you can see a description of the program. Uh, and then we have our six to eight summer math program, which is gonna focus on the big ideas for each one of the grade levels. You see our, uh, the team, we have a teacher, <laughs> one teacher who is going to teach. Um, we have enrollment and this is going to be remote, fully remote. And we were able to do this uh, because again, the flexibility of the program that we're able to, uh, it meets the needs of the teacher and the students. And then we have the MOOCs. Um, this is for enrichment uh, at the high school, massive open online courses. Uh, here's, uh, this is something that's in process of identifying the different uh, things that will be offered for students. So this list may grow um, by the time of the end of the year. And then also we have uh, at the high school uh, credit recovery. Um, and then this is the criteria and this is the goal uh, we want to make sure that we're offering students an option uh, to uh, get those credits that they need to graduate. And then we have our ESY program right here. You'll see um, this is where the programs are going to be located at Monotomy, uh, at Pierce, Gibbs, 
and at the high school. You'll see the report from the SY21 from last summer, how many students attended, and you'll see how many proposed students have been invited to the program for this year, for this summer. And that's pretty much it. I will open it up for questions. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, Dr. McNeil, I had a few questions. Uh, I'll go backwards first. I was just wondering, is there any overlap between the extended school year and the other programs of yes. students? Yeah, you have some students that will be enrolled in both. Mm -hmm. And can they do that? Uh, yes, yeah. if you, hold on, I lost I, I didn't try and do the schedule, so I just, it seemed pretty similar, but I didn't try and actually work it out myself. Excuse me, Dr. McNeil. Yeah, so, um, so students, it depends on what the student is eligible for in um, special education, what is, that's dictated by their individual IEP. So a student may be proposed for speech and language services, but also may be um, eligible uh, or invited to the Title I program, you know, for reading or whatever it is. So that's really an individual basis, but they do primarily run at the same time, if that's um, the direct question. Um, you know, they're running mornings. Ours are Monday through Thursday, um, though, um, from nine to 12. Also, if you look at also if you look at the program for the uh, Title One program, they have staggered classes. So there's also flexibility for any type of overlap, so students can attend if they're able to. Okay, um, then that actually brings me to my other main question, which is the Title One schools. So if I'm understanding this correctly, from a parent's point of view, they need to get their student to Thompson or set up remotely um, three days a week for an hour, starting at different times. Is this correct? Yeah, they'll have uh, schedules, correct. Okay. So I'm just wondering if, so I'm thinking if I'm a working parent, this is kind of a pain. Um, and, you know, cause I'll have my kid in, in a summer camp or, or something. I'm, I'm just wondering how much the schedule is in a impediment to participation, that the fact that it's a short period of time instead of say, as a chunk of a half day summer camp where you, know, you, you pull out the, some of the kids during the day for their classes and the rest of the time they're just doing summer campy things or something. Um, I'm just wondering, do you find that all the kids who are who would benefit from this are actually able to take part in it, or is the schedule a, a problem for them? So thank you. Well, it's an ongoing challenge for us uh, because of you know schedule. We and to, to answer your question, we sent out uh, the number of invitations that we sent out don't reflect the number of students who are actually attending. So we we sent out over three hundred plus invitations for both programs. And if you're able to look, it's, it's a little bit over hundred students that are attending. Uh, we have, we try to, we have the summer fun program uh, activities that are also taking place at Thompson. So we try to make sure that they're in the same place. So if any type of student, any students who are, in, who are enrolled in both can attend without having to worry about transportation. Uh, and that's why we also offer remote. Uh, so we're trying to look at all different types of options in order to uh, take away any barriers that the schedule might, um, you know, might have for any working parent, and it, we're still open. We're, all, we're it's a it's a work in progress. We're always trying to think about new ideas to to provide more access. So I can't. I'm I'm going to say that it's not perfect, uh, but that's where we are right now. And then we'll continue to think about how we can provide access based upon feedback we get from parents. One of the one also is a barrier is we have students that um, come to the program and they may go on a summer vacation. So we also know that attendance is, is a challenge at times. So it's not perfect, but this is what we have in place for right now. Okay, I guess my question would be, um, could you talk to parents, both those who participate and those who choose not to, to find out why are they choosing not to, especially, um, you know, what, 
I'm, I'm just looking at this as a parent and that if I'm over here by Stratton and my child has to be at Thompson for an hour, three times a week, you know, I'm having to get them there and back and there and back. And, and that's a good point that there's summer fun and, and stuff, but just it's not a, it, it provides a barrier for parent and therefore for children's participation. And uh, it just concerns me. That's all, thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I'm really happy to see the uh, extensive uh, programming for English learners. Uh, do you have a sense of uh, how many students might participate? No, uh, like I said before, we sent out the invitations. We have a proposed list of, of uh, students that may attend, but it's not until you actually have the first day of the program and then we, we know how many students are gonna be able to come. So again, that can change throughout the summer depending on what the plans are for, for families. Um, so again, it's not a perfect, uh, but we, it's not perfect, but we, this is what we have in place right now. Um, we thought about, you know, busing. We thought about all these other options to remove barriers, uh, but again, that that's a cost factor attached to that. So, um, the reason why we're able to offer the extended program as it is is because we have the ESSER funds. I mean, if you remember back before the pandemic, it was maybe a third of the students attending. So, I'm very excited about the fact that we're able to have more of an outreach because of the funds that we have um, in order to apply uh, to summer programming. Um, but like, again, like I said before, like we're always open to new ideas and, but we, we know that there's going to be a cost associated with whatever we try to do moving forward. I just want to say I'm appreciative of what I'm seeing here today. And I saw that little invitation to come visit over the summer and that sounds like fun. Thank you. Sure thing. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. So last year, I know we had trouble staffing the, the ELE program. Are we are we doing okay this year or, or where are we on that? No, we're fine. We have the staffing that we need based upon the student population. So I think we're in good shape. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I uh, I also appreciate that the English learner program is going to be in person. I think that's going to make a, a big difference for, for those students. I appreciate that, that you're making that happen this year. Um, the other thing I just want to comment on, I think it's something that comes up every year, but I feel like this is one forum where these summer programs are discussed. And so I just want to, for the public, um, and maybe Ms. Elmer, you can help me a little bit, but <clears throat> the placements for ESY are often sent out um, toward the end of June, as you know, who um, will be teaching what classes and the transportation, the last minute thing, as you know, bus routes um, get get put together. So I don't, Ms. Elmer, I don't know if you want to say any more about that, but I just, I know that that's something that comes up every year and I want to have this as an opportunity for people who might be listening to just understand how that process works. Sure. So <clears throat> actually the bus routes are pretty um, set because they stop at each elementary school um, in on the way over to Pierce and they will also um, stop at um, Audison to drop students off in the afternoon at summer fun if they're enrolled. Um, other than that, that's um, most students would take that transportation other than the door to door transportation that a few students receive as part of their IEPs. Um, the schedule is a little bit different than how it is for the um, other programs that Dr. McNeil described because it is individual to the student. So every student does not come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, nine to 12, right? So they're, they're scheduled individually based on their services. And, and so that does mean that it is, you know, very close to the time that we're going to start. Um, we've set a goal to have those to families by mid-June. Um, uh, Mr. Cardin had asked about staffing. We're still hiring some staff, but we're in a better place than we were last year at this time. So we're feeling better than we were last year heading into the summer as, um, you know, we talked about at several meetings that, the difficulty finding staff. But yes, um, we don't, 
you don't come on a set schedule for all students. So we're not blocking, you know, all third graders at 9 a.m., you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So a student might be getting, you know, this service. So that's why it, it, it's not something that we can set in stone and tell you at the beginning of, you know, the March or uh, even May when the schedules come out. So yes, it's we are working on getting them out as soon as possible, but they are going to come out um, closer to the start of the program, which will be July 11th this year. Great, thank you. No, I just I appreciate making that public because it's it often gets questions. Um, any other committee members before we move on? I do want to correct something that it, it so the, if the question was asked and, and Ms. Elmer did offer explanation as well, but um, the, the students who are eligible for ESY um, in, in the in the report that I gave you, uh, you know, I'm not sure I have to I have to actually go back and we have had students, I think, in the past who have participated in both programs, but I'm not sure for this year that we have students in the ASY program participating in the uh, Title I extended program because of you know, the different services that they're receiving. Um, so I have to do have to go back and I will check on that to confirm. All right. Anybody else? Um, approval of DEI specialist job. Um, Mr. Spiegel or Dr. Holman? I can give this one to Mr. Spiegel for an update. So the CIA committee met last Friday, I think, at you, uh, and met, and this was one of the topics on the agenda to uh, discuss this job description. And we reworked it a little bit, added some language that was suggested um, by the commenters in the last meeting and by the committee members in the last meeting. Um, and so what you have before you includes more language that explicitly identifies um, and names uh, disability um, as a topic, uh, one of the duties, um, one of the areas that the person in this position would be working um, in uh, the, that would be part of their portfolio of including anti-racism, anti-ableism, anti-sexism, social justice, um, that all of those things that they will be working on to advance um, our DEI agenda. So I don't know if there are specific questions about the language. Um, if anyone on the on the committee, the subcommittee um, wants to talk about it or, or Dr. Homan. I'm sorry. The chat everybody just saw on our side is because I, if I look a little distracted, it's because I just found out something happened. <clears throat> my, so I missed that toss over, Mr. Spiegel. Oh, uh, uh, I was, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't know if anybody who was on the subcommittee wanted to speak to the discussion last week or if, um, um, so, um, I don't, if not, or if, the, if anyone has any questions about the changes. So I think Dr. Holman wasn't going to be able to respond right away, uh, Mr. Spielman, uh, Spiegel. Um, so well, I, I know that, but I was I was opening it for yeah. other people on the committee uh, who, um, I, but so no one in the, on the committee are, is asking questions. So I don't know, um, and I, I know there's Here, Dr. Allison and has a question, so we'll uh, let. <clears throat> I don't so much have a question as to say that I appreciate that the. Um, Dr. Homan and uh, uh, Ms. Thomas, the director of DI, took listened to the discussion that was had, and, and um, added words to address uh, many of the concerns that were raised at the CIAA meeting, of which I am not technically a member, so I'm not speaking as a member of that co committee, but. Maybe there's someone else here who wants to. So thank you. Anybody else want to share? Okay. Someone like to make a motion to approve 
the job description? So move approval. approval of the DEI specialist job description. Second. Motion by uh, Mr. Cardin, second by Mr. Hainer. Any more discussion? Okay. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. I don't think Ms. Morgan is here now. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. So it's a six nothing vote to approve the job description. Dr. Allison Ampey? I see uh, Ms. Morgan here, but- she had, Yeah, she had to step away. And so I think oh. when, when she's back, she'll turn her camera back on. Okay. Um, okay. And then Mr. Mason was not able to be here. So he, um, <clears throat> he shared the monthly financial report with all of us. If there are specific questions that committee members have, um, you can reach out to him. And if we have something that we need to follow up on, we can do that at our June 9th meeting. Um, I've asked that he be here for both of those meetings, as I know there'll be some other budget things we need to take care of as we wrap up uh, the fiscal year. Um, the superintendent's report, Dr. Holman. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. I'm back and um, I will start by acknowledging that we have both a community downtick in COVID-19 cases that are being reported to us um, and a pretty sharp decline in the schools, which is great news. Uh, we had a spectacular prom last weekend, as I understand it, required all the students to test ahead of time. We're able to preserve all of our in-person celebrations and events. Um, and have maximum participation for our students in them when we don't have them out because of a COVID infection. So we're very pleased to see these numbers trending down as rapidly as they are. I wanna talk a little bit about indoor masking recommendations, requirements. I wanna thank the community for their patience as we have figured out um, and needed to pivot quickly on where to have recommendations in place versus where to have requirements in place. Um, the monotony requirement with exemption is extended through the end of the school year when we receive exemptions. We are open to having families not mask their student, um, but the monotony preschool has a large proportion of students who um, have medical conditions uh, who also are vulnerable because they haven't been able to be vaccinated. And so this is certainly helping to keep that community um, safe from COVID-19 infections. We are also seeing that the masking requirements have a really significant positive impact when we have a true outbreak occur. We try to make sure that it's a true outbreak. So I wanna talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about that. Uh, it's not, it's a moving target. It's, there are not clean lines that define what constitutes an outbreak. Each situation is really unique. Um, and we look at all of the factors, but there are some general guidelines that we use. And we've collaborated with the Department of Health to sort of um, understand when something is considered an outbreak versus when it's not. And we're using those parameters to help us make our decisions as we go. Masks are a last resort after implementation of other mitigation strategies because they are not learning neutral and we know that. And so where we can avoid um, having extra restrictions in place, we really try to. But when we do have a school-based outbreak, we generally consider that an infection rate of about four to five percent of the school population um, also spread across the school. So we could have an infection rate of four to five percent of the school and population, but it could be really concentrated in one or two classrooms. And so if it's spread across the entire school, if we can't sort of pinpoint a locus or, or a focus area for it, then that's when we might consider a school-wide uh, masking requirement. Also, the period of time matters. So if it's um, four to five percent, but it's spread out over a week, a week and a half, then we may not institute a requirement. We may watch to see if there is a sort of locus that emerges within the school or a set of classrooms where it peaks up over a short period of time. Um, a short period of time is about three to five days. And in cases where we've had pretty significant outbreaks, we have seen a sharp uptick in a 48 hour period. And so those, those are the moments when we institute a mask requirement. Um, once we've had a mask requirement in place in a school for about a week, sometimes a week and a half, we begin to see pretty sharp declines in cases and we're happy to lift it and have it be a recommendation again. 
Classroom-based outbreaks are generally monitored with some mitigation when there are three or four cases in the room uh, before we would institute a requirement. Once we get to about five or more cases in a single classroom, depending on the circumstances, that's when we're going to consider a requirement for that classroom. Um, we do keep an eye on things like, you know, do, are there known cases in the household? Um, do, do we have a cluster at a particular seating arrangement area of the classroom? Do we know of events that happened outside of the classroom, um, such as gatherings that may have included multiple students from a single classroom? So those are things that we um, ask questions about when we have cases so that we can kind of determine what our next moves or mitigation strategy should be in the interest of keeping those as light as possible. Um, the recommendation is intended mostly to protect staffing levels at our schools. We understand that we are in a position where the virus is becoming endemic to society. Um, and that means that we're all learning how to live with some level of COVID-19 being around us. And so what we're really looking at also when we put new mitigation strategies in place is, are we going to be able to continue to operate, to have students in school for in-person learning as much as possible, and to have them have access to the teachers who they depend on having access to every day um, without us needing to shuffle around service providers, shuffle around our educators too much. Um, and that creates inconsistency for the kids, which is not good educationally. Those who haven't been infected since January 22 are right now at pretty high risk of infection in the current surge. Um, that's something we've learned from our partnership with the Department of Health and that folks who were initially infected with the Delta variant are pretty and haven't gotten the subsequent Omicron variants um, are pretty susceptible to infection right now. And so that mask recommendation is really intended to help us protect staffing levels and to help us protect all of those uh, in-person events. And it's pretty strongly recommended for those of you who may not have had infections since January 20, uh, 2022. So that's a bit of an update on how the indoor masking determinations work. Right now, like I um, had messaged to the community, we're on a recommendation for the entire district, but we don't have any requirements in place for an entire school at the moment with the exception of Monotomy. Um, we did receive some updates from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education earlier this week. Uh, one, it, most of these were um, linked to our pool testing program. And we learned what the plans are from the state to continue or not. Um, some of the testing initiatives that they have been uh, helping us with uh, by resourcing for the past couple of years. So they, in spring of 2022, they do intend to continue the current testing program. Um, Arlington Public Schools will not do testing the last week of school as we wrap up the year and wrap up our nurses' offices. Uh, we will need to suspend testing um, before that last week of school. We will change uh, the protocol for students that are identified as close contacts in accordance with the state and new guidelines that are coming out. Students no longer need to quarantine if they are close contacts. They should continue to mask for 10 days and we recommend testing on day five, but it's not required. Um, in summer of, oh, also we're gonna shift APS test to return. And if you recall, this is a program that requires that in order to return to school between day six and 10, students produce a negative antigen test and report that to us. We're gonna to continue to recommend that, but it is not required for the remainder of the school year if it helps students be in school. Um, and as long as they continue to wear a mask and they have had a resolution of symptoms, then they're considered to be shedding the virus. And so it's not necessary that they um, test to return in order to mitigate spread at this point. In summer of 2022, there is not going to be any state program support. Self-tests and symptomatic testing will continue and we have the resources to support that for families, uh, but there's no state program. In other words, the state will not be providing us with cool testing resources um, or providing us with antigen tests to pass out to families. We do have a healthy stock of antigen tests that we can continue to provide to families should they need it, as well as use for our students in our nurses' offices. And the same is true for fall of 2022. Schools will be able to purchase self-tests through a statewide contract to keep in their nurses' offices or to provide to families, um, but there won't be a state program and there won't be state program support. We've spoken with our nurses about this and to get a sense of how they are feeling about it. They completely agree with this approach from the state and say that they are looking forward to having the time and capacity to continue some of the health screenings that they've 
been known to do um, in previous years and have sometimes not had the capacity to do because we've been very focused on screening for COVID-19. Uh, this isn't to say that we won't be vigilant about it um, in the next school year, and I will look forward to updating the committee on what our plans will be to keep track of COVID-19 outbreaks and infections next year so that we can make sure we keep everyone as safe as possible, but wanted to update you on the status of testing for next school year as soon as we had the information available. And a few additional updates. Um, I will be sending out, likely as soon as this meeting is done, some community input uh, on three different topics. One is a COVID-19 booster clinic interest survey. Um, students uh, ages five through 12 were recently approved to receive a booster shot. And so we're working with the Department of Health and Human Services to run a school-based clinic and would like to gauge interest from the community on uh, attending one of those. We are working on a district and school website update and revision, and we have a community survey to ask users what they usually look for on the district website, what they would like to see improve on the district website, and what some things are that they might like to see featured on the new district website. So we will be sending that uh, survey out very, very shortly, and we're also going to resend the before school programming survey that was sent earlier out for community input so that we can decide whether or not to pilot some programming for before school care for families in the following school year. I already provided a bit of an update on strategic planning. We have had um, five of our six in-person meetings as well as the online launch, and we have one more left. We did have our strategic planning meetings scheduled this past week on the same day as the news um, out of Texas landed, and we needed to pivot our agenda a little bit um, to allow for folks to get home and for the administration to convene and consider responses. Um, so we didn't meet for as long as we intended to, which means that at our next meeting, we're going to be looking at both mission statements and at building some strategic priorities. So we'll be condensing some of our work a little bit and then maybe doing some follow-up asynchronous work with the committee afterwards. We have started doing the after-school planning meetings that I referenced at a recent school committee meeting um, where we presented some of the after-school data for the next school year. Three of these have been completed so far at various schools and we've established some action steps with teams to sort of solidify some procedures um, and some space usage uh, challenges that we can address with the teams so that we can try to open up as much space as possible in our after-school programs for next year. Um, we have an instructional leadership team workshop on May 31st for administrators and coaches that I'm really looking forward to following the holiday weekend. We're going to talk there about how to make sure that our leadership teams at our schools are really empowered and involved in the development of school improvement plans in partnership with school councils for next year and be able to share a little bit of a preview of where, um, where we're headed with some of the work that we're looking at for next year and the goals that you looked at for today. You have your enrollments um, available in your Novus materials, no significant changes from the last set of reports that you got. And then a few updates on administrator hiring searches. We are um, offering our congratulations to Kim Visco, who is going to be our new director of K-12 Wellness. Uh, we have a final round tomorrow for K-12 Visual Arts Director and are looking forward to an announcement on that in the coming week. The bracket assistant principal first round of interviews is complete and the Stratton assistant principal resigned recently and that position has been posted. And um, our Arlington High School special education coordinator search is in its final stages with an announcement coming soon. I'm yeah. happy to take any questions from the community. Oh, did you have one more, Mr. Spiegel, did I miss one? We, the director of social studies, um, we had some interviews uh, last night and we have some more next week. Thank you. Take any questions? Can I also add one other thing? Um, for uh, our last two um, sets of uh, district-wide um, director interviews, we've had students on the committee. And I just want to also add that the students have been wonderful on these committees. And I think Dr. McNeil would agree that it's been great to include student and uh, community rep parent voice on these committees as well. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Dr. Allison Ampey? Sorry, I seem to be quick off the mark today. Um, so two questions. One, um, I know we raised the question 
I mean, I asked the question about the masking requirements because there was some confusion in the community about the difference between strongly recommended and recommended. And honestly, thinking about it, we've only got four weeks left. So at this point, I think I'm not going to worry about it. We can talk about it next year. Um, but I'm just acknowledging that there was confusion. I think right now it's going to just be recommended or required and we're good. So my other question is regarding the enrollment data, the projection. And I guess I'm wondering why we're projecting only 63 Menonomy students. Um, I understand that it's somewhat dependent on how many students have IEPs that suggest they should be going or you know that say that they should be going to monotony but we also have to keep our ratios good and since we add IEP students throughout the year shouldn't we bump our gen ed students up some at the start so that we keep our ratio good throughout the time anyway that's sure. my question um, so that's, you can, what happened was I had a sort of a penciled in estimate on monotomy in the previous report. And then we recently turned over some data in the school, in the uh, student information system. And it was starting to capture the existing real enrollments at monotomy. But we know that those fluctuate throughout the year and they grow throughout the year. So that's reflecting the real number that's coming from the SIS. I could substitute it with a number that we anticipate monotomy would level out at if that's more helpful for your projections, or we could leave it that way and it will automatically pull the real number that's coming in. But we're staffed for whatever the true enrollment um, we anticipate is at monotomy, not for whatever the SIS is reflecting right now based on enrollments that we know have come in. I guess. I'm trying to predict what the October 1 numbers will be, um, just to have a sense of, are we growing? Are we shrinking? What's happening to our budget, et cetera. Not, I'm not worried that we're not gonna have the teachers and staff for monotomy. Um, just, I am concerned about the ratios because I know that has been a problem in the past that sometimes we come out of balance with um, students with IEP and general education students because we haven't, we, we don't have the right balance, um, but uh, mainly I'm concerned about trying to predict our October 1 numbers. So thank you. Anybody else? Um, I just wanted to ask, Dr. Homan, are you going to send out a <clears throat> communication about the, the change to a testing recommendation as opposed to a testing requirement? Mm -hmm. So my, I want to wait until we get some of the final revised guidelines back from the state and have some time to put them into something that's going to be clear for the community to understand. So I'm aiming for early next week to get something out to the community explaining any revised guidelines. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, <clears throat> MASC Delegate Assembly Resolutions, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Arlington's, excuse me, Arlington School Committee is very well respected around the state. And one of the things that MASC does every year is holds a delegate uh, assembly in which resolutions of important public policy are discussed and voted. Uh, we've been asked to submit a couple of resolutions simply because uh, uh, that we're well respected and, uh, and and the things that we've presented in the past have been well received by the assembly. So I put together two resolutions that I would hope the, the committee will vote to send to MASC for consideration of the delegate assembly. Uh, normally the deadline was July 1st, but this year they moved it up to June 1st. So that's why we're on now instead of uh, next meeting. The first resolution, um, uh, pertains to uh, state, uh, the State Board of Education. This is one we've done in the past. Um, there are many professions and trades around the state and every single one of them has a licensing board or agency that either includes members of the profession or is exclusively for members of the profession, such as the legal profession, the board of uh, bar overseers, 
are all attorneys. Uh, our, the licensure for teachers and educators is governed by the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. And state law prohibits licensed practicing educators and school committee members from being members of this board. And given that the State Board of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education has a lot of policy influence and can set a whole bunch of mandates, uh, it, it is totally unreasonable that the people who actually know uh, teaching and learning uh, either through the governance side on school committees or as practitioners in our schools are specifically excluded. So the resolution would resolve that the Massachusetts Association of School Committee calls for the enactment of legislation to repeal the provision of the Massachusetts law that prohibits practicing educators and sitting school committee members from serving on the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, and be it further resolved that the Mass Association of School Committees calls for legislation to reconstitute the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education by including members with expertise as licensed educators uh, and members with expertise in public school governance. This is uh, critical this year as well, because we're gonna get a new governor in January uh, which means that the current administration, who is uh, openly hostile to any kind of educators participating in public governance, uh, will be gone. And I'm optimistic that a new governor would uh, be uh, a better friend to uh, public school governance. The other resolution uh, it represents one of the worst forms of voter suppression uh, that we have is, is everywhere every way is evil is what we're seeing coming out of Texas, Florida. Um, the state has tremendous power to uh, take over a school district, to appoint an overseer, to replace the school committee and the superintendent. And while there may be emergency situations or difficult situations where uh, it's important to interrupt the local governance structure for a short period of time, uh, Lawrence, Holyoke, and Southbridge are, were placed under receivership, and none of them have emerged back from it. Uh, the Boston Globe, uh, within the past week, had an extensive article analyzing test scores, graduation rates, college enrollment, and other, uh, a dozen other metrics, and it shows that the uh, state has failed to meet almost all of its stated goals, and that... Um, there's absolutely no plan on the part of the state to uh, return uh, these districts to local governance. Lawrence has been under receivership since 2011, Holyoke since, since 2015, and Southbridge since 2016. So the resolution that we, we would be proposing would be for uh, the, uh, permitting a short-term state takeover for no, no more than three years. Uh, and that language would be, be it resolved that the Massachusetts Association of School Committees calls on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to restore local governance accountability for the Lawrence, Holyoke, and Southbridge Public Schools no later than July 1st, 2023, and be it further resolved that the Mass Association of School Committees calls on the Massachusetts legislature to enact legislation to mitigate limit any future state takeovers to a term of no more than three years. I think these are very sound public policy proposals at a junction in time in which we have a new administration coming in uh, and that they will be well received by the delegate assembly. So I move that we uh, adopt these for submission to MASC for the delegate assembly. Second. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Schlickman and a second by Dr. Allison Amphi. Any further discussion? Oh, are we going to vote on each one separately or one to get our vote? We should vote on them separately. If you want to divide the question, uh, I have no problem with that. Let's divide the question. Okay, we will start with, sorry, and now I'm looking at the second one, with the board, um, <clears throat> membership of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education with a motion by Mr. Schlickman and a second by Dr. Allison Amphi. Does anyone wanna discuss that resolution? Okay, roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. 
Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Slickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous. All right. Uh, the second resolution, <clears throat> preserving local governance of Massachusetts schools, a uh, motion by Mr. Schlickman and a second by Dr. Allison Ampey. Any further discussion? Mr. Cardin. Uh, thanks. So I would support the part of the motion that calls on the legislature to change the law governing receivership, but I don't, I don't think that that I or all of us have enough information about the situation in those three cities um, to call on the state to do anything specific to those three cities. So I'm not going to be able to support this. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Mr. Cardin summed up exactly my sentiment. Yes. Anybody else? Dr. Allison Ampey. I feel as a resolution, this is going to be going through the MASC legislative committee and that they'll iron out the bumps um, in there. And that to me, this is more a way of raising this in awareness and getting it discussed. Um, so I, I understand what Mr. Cardin and, and Mr. Thielman are saying, but I will vote in uh, support of this. Anybody else? All right, uh, roll call vote, Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? No. Oh, hold on now, I'm gonna have to do math. Mr. Cardin? No. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? No. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. It's a 4-3 vote in the affirmative. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22257, dated May 17th, 2022, in the amount of $720,485.17. Regular meeting minutes, May 12th, 2022. Motion. So move. Second. A motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Cardin. Roll call vote, Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. The consent agenda passes unanimously. Uh, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, thank you. We met earlier this week. Uh, we discussed program fees, um, and we're going to be getting more information at a later meeting to uh, review them and consider adjustments for the coming year. Um, we discussed the uh, FY22 budget and recommended that if we ultimately have excess funds that they be transferred to the special education reserve um, fund. And, um, but that's still in process of being finalized. We had discussions in preparation for the long range planning meeting that happened this morning. And I think that's pretty much it. So thank you. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. Um, on May 21st, we had a school committee chat uh, for English language learner families. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the chair and the superintendent and anyone else involved for providing uh, interpreters. Uh, there was, for those that sought it, there was one parent who did, and we had 
that parent, uh, the interpreter, Mr. Cardin, myself, and uh, another community member that was not ELL. Uh, the discussion uh, centered around concern for uh, documents not sent to, uh, the statement was made not sent to parents in their native language, concerned that all other school related documents do not go out in the four major languages as required by the state. A concern that there are no interpreters translations available during parent events at school. Uh, there was a sharing that there will be, an, we shared that there would be a, a new school webpage and translation should be less of an issue with the, the new webpage coming forward. A uh, question was asked, where can information be found regarding the civil rights compliance review from several years ago? Uh, that was later provided by Mr. Cardin to that person. A lot of these concerns, this is my opinion, and give Mr. Cardin to add any more, uh, were brought by the community person, not the uh, English language learner parent. Uh, a lot of the stuff, there was concerns from the past. And uh, it was our opinion, my opinion, that we need to go forward. And I think uh, Dr. Holman is going in that direction uh, with all the other staff in the system. Um, I would invite Mr. Cardin to add anything more if I missed anything. Nope, that's, that's pretty much correct. On, in the last review that I, I did send on um, the, the item about translations, we were cleared by the state. We were we were considered fully implemented. So uh, at least in the state review, um, we have implemented the state requirements. I think the community members concern is that we should be going beyond the state requirements. Um, and we are in several respects. And, and, and we, I've let her know um, about the changes that Dr. Homan has put in place, um, including the, the additional translators that we had, for example, at the chat. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so she's now aware of that and, um, and, and also will be able to, uh, uh, communicate directly with Dr. Holman if she has additional concerns. I'd just like to add that the parent was uh, appreciative of having the interpreter there. Um, and uh, it, it would, I'm very happy with that. And the, and the translator went to Groton Dunstable High School for a year where Bill used to teach. And they, and both, they both knew a, a, an additional exchange student. So it was a very we, small role. We, we had her close friend as an exchange student, which when she said she was an exchange student from Rotten Dunstable, I go, wow, small world. Uh, can, can I have? Can, yeah, Dr. McNeil, I see your hand. No, I, I, and I also want to respond. Thank you, Mr. Cardin, for providing that information to the community member. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that on our website, we have an interactive document that uh, parents have access to that they can fill out. And we have a staff member within our district that receives a stipend for making sure that the interpreter and any documents that need to be translated are, 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 are taken care of. So I just wanna make sure that everybody in the community knows that. And that was that review that I received, I inherited when I first came into the district. And we have, uh, since then we have uh, received um, we have uh, complied with all of the uh, subsequent reviews that we've gone through as well. So I just want to add that uh, information into that. Thank share you. that information as well. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. CIAA, um, Ms. Morgan. Uh, we met last week. We went over the 22, 23 um, strategic objectives. We talked about um, the process for getting updates on the 21-22 district goals. Um, and we um, looked at the DEI uh, position that was approved tonight. Thank you. And I have heard um, from a number, uh, it's, my, it's my week to shine, I guess. I've heard from a number of students um, as part of their civics project at the Audison that uh, have some issues that they would like addressed um, at CIAA, which is very exciting. So I do think that we will try to get one more meeting in this year so that we can address um, or at least hear uh, their concerns. Dr. Holman. 
just want to say civics action project time is one of my favorite times of year. And I really appreciate the work that the eighth grade teachers have done to, to do these sort of action research projects with the students because I've enjoyed speaking with many of them too. And they're really great projects that they're working on. Thank you. Um, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policy and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. We do have a meeting scheduled early in June. Um, I don't have the date in front of me. Uh, and the computer's all full of other screens. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure it's in the calendar and everybody's aware of it. Thank you. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We meet June 7th, I think it is. And um, we're, we're, the project is moving along, along on budget on time. Excellent. Please on reports or announcements. Mr. Hainer. I mean, uh, two announcements. Number one, uh, as of uh, three weeks, past three weeks, there were three mock town meetings by third graders. And I'm going to make a public statement. They do it much better than the regular town meeting, uh, clean and concise from the three schools. Did a great job. The other announcement is that uh, it's in the calendar. Audison will be having a program uh, for veterans uh, dealing with Memorial Day. And uh, we have a phenomenal speaker, a uh, young lady, uh, graduate of the Air Force Academy, who is a current uh, A-10 pilot. Uh, she's really, a, I was a little, a couple of minutes late coming to the earlier meeting and I had just listened to her and I'm looking forward to hearing it again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to um, extend my appreciation to Mr. Hainer for the work that he has done with the mock town meeting with the third graders. I had the opportunity to go to the Stratton mock town meeting and the amount of um, work that Mr. Hainer does to support the students and then ensures that everyone who wants a chance to speak um, gets to speak and students who might not feel comfortable at the beginning are getting up and standing in front of their classmates in, in town hall and speaking. So thank you very much, Mr. Hainer. It was a really wonderful experience. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Dr. Allison Ampey. I just want to make an aside on the Arlington High School uh, building project. I just noted in today's um, Globe, there's an article about how the MBTA is building a bus facility or wants to build a bus facility in Quincy. And I looked it up and it's only 350,000 square feet that it was coming in at a price tag of $402 million. And we have built a high school, which is, or we are in the process of building a high school with all the accoutrements that a high school has um, of 400 and 11,000 square feet for under $300 million. So I just wanna say, I think we're getting quite the bargain. And also I have no idea what they're doing down in Quincy, but um, that's all. I just thought it was a very interesting comparison. Thank you. Thank you. Great, future agenda items, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we've been in negotiations with our unions, and I had an informal uh, conversation with the traffic supervisors. They had identified some trouble spots uh, uh, in town, and they would appreciate if we were to go and express our concern over a couple of specific locations in a letter to the select board and TAC. So if we could have that uh, letter on the agenda for the next meeting. I'll write something up uh, based on our conversations presented to the committee with the hope that uh, you'll approve it and we can send it uh, along. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so we will um, be going into executive session. We will not be returning to uh, regular session afterwards. Um, <clears throat> after this, I will entertain a motion to enter into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel 
for contract negotiations with union and or non-union, in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To construct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. AEA Unit D negotiations, executive session minutes, May 12th, 2022. Mr. Cardin. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, did we do the consent agenda? Did I miss that or did we? We did. Yes. Did. Okay, sorry, Never mind. Uh, so a motion for executive. A move. Second. All right, a motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Schlickman. Roll call vote, Mr. Hainer. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous. We'll be going into executive session. 